Tree, which is being held as part of the 30th anniversary academic sessions of the Faculty of Medicine, University of uh, Kalani. <clears throat> Today's plenary is on improving quality of preventive care for chronic disease in South Asia, the NIHR Global Research Network. Our distinguished speaker today is Professor John Chambers from Imperial College, London. Professor John Chambers graduated with a BA first class from Oxford University. He went on to complete an MBBS and PhD at London University. His research focuses on identification of mechanisms that underlie the high rate of cardiovascular disease and diabetes in Asian populations, as well as translational research to improve prevention and control of these major diseases. Supported by major funding from the MRC and the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, and from NMRC and ASTA in Singapore, he has established and leads large-scale prospective population studies in Europe, South Asia, and Singapore. These unique population cohorts have led to the discovery of novel genetic and epigenetic pathways associated with coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and related metabolic disturbances implicating new molecular pathways underlying these diseases. The collaboration between Professor Chambers and the Department of Public Health spans over a decade. We have been working together on a number of epidemiological studies and trials on the prevention and control of diabetes and cardiovascular disease among South Asians. We have been a partner institution to the Global Health Research Unit for Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease among South Asians, funded by the National Institute of Health Research UK, which supported the establishment of the National Institute of Health Research, Global Health Research Unit South Asia Center of Excellence for NCD Epidemiology at the University of Kalani. The GRU has completed five years and had been funded for another five years this year. We are sure that this will lead to some important work on the epidemiology of these diseases, as well as capacity building in prevention and control of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease in South Asia. Over to John. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the committee for their kind invitation to share the work being done in our global health research network. Since this presentation is pre-recorded, I don't know what background information has been provided. So I thought that I would start with a high level summary of my principal research interests and activities. I'm a clinician scientist. I trained as a cardiologist, but became passionate about global health and the health of South Asian populations in particular. I'm now a professor of epidemiology at Imperial College London and the LKC School of Medicine in Singapore. My primary research efforts aim to understand why diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease are more common in Asian populations and translate that knowledge into effective and scalable approaches to disease prevention. Over the last two decades, I have established three large scale prospective population studies focused on the health of Asian individuals namely the Lollipop, South Asia Biobank, and SG100K studies. I've also coordinated a number of intervention studies for diabetes prevention in Asian populations. I'm presently the director of the Global Health Research Network 
for diabetes and cardiovascular disease in South Asia. In my spare time, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program. While preparing this talk, I found two infographics that I wanted to share with the audience to lead into describing the programme of work. The first is a representation of the unrelenting march of diabetes globally. It's a figure most of us will be familiar with and that I have, and that I have seen many times. It's also one that has commonly puzzled me, in particular because the reported burden of diabetes in the Southeast Asia region appears to be broadly the same as in other major global regions. This isn't my impression of diabetes in South Asia, and I doubt very much that it's the experience of the audience. This is a more valuable representation of the problem. The left panel shows the burden of diabetes amongst South Asians living in the UK compared to UK Europeans. We see that at every age, South Asians are about three times more likely to have diabetes. On the right hand side, we show previously unseen data from our population cohorts in South Asia. And strikingly, we show the same major health disparity. Diabetes rates amongst South Asians in India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka are almost identical to those of South Asians in the UK and are almost three times higher than a comparable European population. We see that in both South Asia and the UK, people of South Asian heritage have a metabolic health that is equivalent to a European who is 20 years older. What is the basis for this major health inequality? In short, we don't know. Let me share some data to clarify that view. On the left hand side of the slide is the burden of diabetes in Asians stratified by BMI in the top panel or by waist hip ratio as a measure of central obesity in the bottom panel. In both panels, we see that the increased risk of diabetes amongst South Asians remains present across the range of adiposity measures. So, as quantified by BMI or waist hip girth ratio, adiposity does not explain the different metabolic health outcomes of South Asians. On the right hand side, I show the results of a formal regression analysis to test whether a range of known risk factors explains the difference in risk between the populations. The results show that even when we take account of differences in age, gender, body mass index, waist hip girth ratio, glycemic indices, physical activity as measured by questionnaire, and known genetic susceptibility factors, then South Asians are still more than twice as likely to develop diabetes as their European counterparts. Our lack of knowledge about the mechanisms driving increased risk in South Asians have major implications for tackling the unrelenting march of diabetes. This is true from both a public health and a personalised medicine perspective. While weight loss is indeed one of the most effective strategies we have for preventing diabetes, equalising risk between South Asians and Europeans would require approximately a 20% reduction in weight at a whole population level. This is manifestly impossible. From a personalised medicine perspective, our ability to identify high-risk individuals for targeted interventions is confounded and weakened by the lack of knowledge of the risk factors determining disease. If you don't know what's driving it, then you can't measure it, 
you can't put it into risk functions and you can't accurately identify the high risk individuals. The case that I'm trying to make is that there is an urgent, unmet need to understand the mechanisms underlying the high rates of diabetes in South Asians so that we can better risk stratify and better prevent the disease. Whilst my slides are very focused on diabetes as a use case, the situation is strikingly similar for cardiovascular disease. The second intriguing infographic that I want to share concerns healthcare costs attributable to diabetes across global regions. You will see that it gives the unfortunate impression that the costs attributable to diabetes are primarily a problem for Europe and South America, North America. This is of course highly misleading because it does not take into account the differing resources available for healthcare between global regions. This slide summarizes healthcare expenditure data collected by the World Bank. It shows two key features. The first is that the quantum of funding available for healthcare is an astonishing 100 fold lower in South Asia than in the US. In addition, the bulk of healthcare spend in South Asia comes as out of pocket expense, thus carrying a disproportionate effect on those living with disease. A major consequence of these profound resource constraints is that uptake of pharmacological interventions for disease prevention and control is much lower in South Asia than in, other, than in more developed regions. This in turn impacts on quality of care. This can be assessed and demonstrated by numerous metrics, but taking data from our own population cohort as an example, we can show that the majority of South Asians living with diabetes have poor control as evidenced by raised HbA1c. The third and final piece of background that I'd like to highlight is that things are likely to get worse before they get better. In addition to the rising prevalence of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases, rising prevalence, there are also major demographic changes that continue to shift the global burden of chronic disease away from Europe and the US to South Asia and the Asia Pacific region. Taking India as a case illustration, from 2011 to 2031, the population will increase in size by 264 million people, equivalent to the entire population of North America and the number of elderly people will almost double, rising by 91 million people, more than the entire population of the UK. These changes alone will increase the number of people living with diabetes in India by about 100%. I've selected this classic illustration of public health policy to illustrate the position then that we find ourselves in. We see that the floor is flooded, but the tap is on full. We don't know why, and we have no way of turning it off. The team then are doing their best to mop up the floor, but they've got tools that are weak and they're in desperate need of better solutions. That leads me to introduce our Global Health Research Network that is focused specifically on improving understanding of etiology and improving prevention and quality of care for diabetes and cardiovascular disease in South Asia. The network is funded by the UK's National Institute for Health Research and represents a partnership between leading clinical and academic centres across South Asia. The network is coordinated by Imperial College London, the Universities of Cambridge and Melbourne, and NTU in Singapore are major established collaborators. The primary ambitions of our network are twofold. 
First, we aim to better understand the behavioral, environmental, and molecular factors that drive chronic disease in South Asian populations. Secondly, we aim to develop and demonstrate innovative solutions to improving health in South Asian settings using individual, population, and policy-based interventions. We also seek to build capacity for fundamental and applied research relevant to non-communicable disease in South Asia. Our research activity is based in four key domains, understanding population health, developing digital interventions for health promotion, strengthening quality of care through care coordination, and policy and environmental interventions for health promotion. We are now a big team, with this slide summarising just the key investigators. On the top, I'd like to highlight the lead investigators from South Asia, whose tremendous efforts make this network possible. From left to right, we have Dr. R.M. Anjana from the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, who is also Deputy Director of the network. Malay Marida leads for Brack University in Bangladesh, Sajit Jha for Max Healthcare in Delhi, Khadija Kawaja for the Services Institute of Medical Science in Lahore. I'm sure the last two, Prasad Katalanda and Anu Kastari Ratni, are well known to all of you. I'm now going to talk through our programmes of work, starting with our observational epidemiology. To lay the foundations for this, I'd first like to highlight that there are a range of chronic diseases that are of high importance to South Asians and which all are understudied. The reason for raising this is that if we're going to create an epidemiological framework to address diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we should maximize the opportunity to ensure that we can address other important phenotypes as well. On the right hand side of the slide is the result of the regression model that I showed earlier demonstrating that traditional risk factors don't explain increased risk of diabetes in South Asians. Again, to help understand our epidemiological strategy, I'd like to expand on this some more. Here I summarise the primary results of an ongoing large-scale study that we have done to identify whether genetic factors account for the increased risk of diabetes in South Asia. We lead a consortium called the South Asian Type 2 Diabetes Study, which involves whole genome data from more than 100,000 South Asian people. Using genome-wide association, we identify genetic loci predisposing to diabetes. On this slide, the results are presented as what's called a Manhattan plot, with the green dots representing genetic regions associated with increased risk of diabetes. There are two striking features. First, all of the genetic loci identified in South Asians are already known risk variants identified by studies in Europeans. Secondly, from the inset panel, there is no consistent difference in risk allele frequency between Asians and Europeans. Taken together, the genetic map for diabetes appears basically the same in South Asians and Europeans. There is therefore no evidence that genetic factors contribute to any of the increased risk of diabetes in South Asian communities. We've carried out similar studies looking for genetic factors underlying other cardiovascular and metabolic traits. The story has been consistent. In every analysis, the genetic variants we identify are shared with Europeans and do not explain excess risk in South Asians. The conclusion from these genetic studies is that the high risk of cardiovascular metabolic disease is, cannot be explained by genetics and is more likely to be determined therefore by behavioral and environmental factors. At one level, I take this as being fantastic news because these are more likely to be modifiable. This issue is also of great importance for the design of future population studies. Based upon these findings, there is less need 
to emphasize genetics, but there is a strong need for us to better understand environmental and behavioral exposures. The next problem we face and that informs our epidemiological research is the lack of data for South Asians specifically. Whilst there are some existing cohorts, these are limited by modest sample size, weak questionnaires, limited biological sample collection, and a lack of, of longitudinal follow-up. In addition, many of the existing cohorts are in fact based in overseas settings, further limiting their relevance to South Asia. I'd also like to highlight the and emphasize the importance of measuring things well in cohort studies. Here I show the results of a truly lovely study led by one of our major collaborators, Soren Braga from the University of Cambridge. Using data from the UK Biobank study, he shows that increasing physical activity measured by objectively by accelerometer strongly protects against all cause mortality. The effect sizes are strong, substantially stronger than anything identified using weak instruments such as questionnaires. This is a general principle of what we might call regression dilution. If you don't measure things well, you underestimate risk relationships. So this study provides proof of principle that the importance of physical activity as a risk factor for disease is likely to have been underappreciated based upon our usual questionnaire-based assessments. As a general truism, the use of strong measuring tools improves accuracy in our research and generates new insights. Our Global Health Research Network as a team therefore argues that there is a major need for a well-powered, comprehensive population study in South Asians and that such a study must, pl must place a strong emphasis on understanding environmental and behavioral factors in addition to genetic exposures. To address this need, we have therefore established South Asia Biobank as a prospective population study based in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. There are five primary study regions and more than 100 study sites. We are recruiting men and women aged 18 and above, and our target is to recruit at least 150,000 people. South Asia Biobank participants undergo a structured, comprehensive assessment using standardized protocols and standardized study equipment at all sites. The assessment includes health and lifestyle questionnaire, 24-hour dietary recall, anthropometry, blood pressure, lung function, 12 lead ECG, retinal imaging, and physical activity measured by accelerometer. Data are collected using a customized database with direct data capture from machines wherever possible to improve data quality. I'd particularly like to highlight a collaboration with the University of Cambridge, which brings major expertise in the assessment of diet and physical activity through their center for diet and activity research. The key collaborators from Cambridge are Professor Nick Wareham, Nita Fruri, and Soren Braga. We collect biological samples from all participants, including whole bird, citrate plasma, EDTA plasma, serum, buffy coat, and urine. In addition, PAX gene tubes have been collected for the majority to allow assessment of RNA signaling. Participants are asked for consent to use the data and samples for health-related research, molecular phenotyping, working with other scientists, data and sample sharing, and linkage to health records where available. Participants also consent to recontact, for example, to enable follow-up. The output is a rich data set that already contains almost 1,000 data items. Data collection started in January 2019, and we recruited almost 50,000 people in year one. The COVID pandemic had a tremendous negative impact on recruitment, which was effectively paused for 12 months. Activity restarted in 2021, 
and on the 30th of September, I'm delighted to say that we achieved the 100,000th participant recruited. We anticipate completing recruitment in approximately 12 to 18 months time. We will enrich the baseline phenotypic data through molecular profiling of our stored samples. Assays for HbA1c, renal function, liver function, lipid profile, and NMR metabolome are already in progress. DNA extraction and genomic profiling are also underway. Results for these for the first 100,000 people should be completed towards the end of 2022. In due course, we also anticipate extending the molecular phenotyping to include assessment of gene transcription, genome regulation, and proteomic profiling. The study is designed to be a prospective population cohort, although we do recognize the challenges of achieving this in these settings. We have preliminary funding from NIHR to carry out follow-up during 2023 and 2024. We anticipate this will concentrate on the 100,000 people recruited to date. The primary endpoints will be all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. We will carry out verbal autopsy for people known to have died. For, for survivors, we will carry out questionnaire, weight, blood pressure, HbA1c and ECG. The output of this effort will be a unique repository of clinical and molecular data from more than 150,000 people across South, South Asia that can be used by researchers to understand the biology of health and disease, to improve approaches to risk stratification, and to develop novel therapy, therapeutic approaches to health promotion and disease prevention in South Asia. To achieve this ambition, it is critical to make the data available to research teams, so-called data democratization. We're in the process of establishing a platform for secure data sharing and analysis that will enable the state of, our, of the art research plan. We have a tremendous number of specific hypotheses that we already plan to pursue. These include key questions around the contribution of diet and physical activity to health in South Asia, a deeper investigation of genetic factors influencing health, and the use of Mendelian randomization to assess causal pathways. We will pursue biomarker discovery and develop and validate both non-laboratory and laboratory approaches to risk stratification for incident disease. To illustrate the power of the cohort and the wide range of opportunities that it generates for clinically relevant research, I'd like to share a use case involving South Asia Biobank spirometry data. Imagine a clinical scenario. A 45-year-old woman from Colombo complains of feeling breathless. Her physician arranges lung function tests. These measure FEV1, 1.55 litres, FEC 1.89 litres and a ratio of 0.81. The spirometer also provides an automated report that estimates what her lung function should be based upon reference equations developed by the Global Lung Initiative. Based on these international algorithms, our patients FEV1 and FEC are reported to be low at 75% of normal, leading to a diagnosis of possible respiratory restrictive ventilatory defect. However, these existing reference equations for interpretation of lung function tests do not include data from South Asians and have never been validated for use in this population. As part of our research, we have therefore used South Asia Biobank data to carry out an evaluation of the accuracy of these international lung function prediction models. For this exercise, we focus on healthy South Asians, that is people who have never smoked, don't have any chronic disease, and have no respiratory symptoms. The results are summarized on this slide. 
FEV, FEV1 is on the left, FVC on the right. For simplicity, only a very small subset of the data are presented. The measurements taken from our participants are shown as black dots and labelled as observed data. The values predicted for the same individuals based upon their age, gender, height and weight are shown in open symbols using the NHANES and the GLI prediction equations. As we can see, the NHANES and GLI equations both greatly overestimate normal FEV1 and FVC for our South, for our South Asian participants. The error is enormous. In particular, in, in particular, NHANES overestimates what normal lung function should be by about 50%. We can show that using these international algorithms results in between 20 to 50% of healthy South Asians being labelled as abnormal and specifically as having small lung volumes and a restrictive ventilatory defect. This misdiagnosis can of course be expected to lead to anxiety, further inappropriate investigation, increased healthcare cost and inappropriate treatment. To move beyond this, we have used our data to develop and validate a new reference equation specifically for South Asians. The performance of this reference equation in internal validation is shown by the green arrow the open boxes. And we can see that the predictions are highly accurate when compared to the observed data in internal validation. We have gone further still and carried out external validation. To really challenge the tool, we use data from South Asians living overseas who had indeed been characterized by an entirely different study team using a different spirometer and a different study protocol. The results are summarized on this slide and, I'll, and I will talk through their presentation. The left-hand figures show results for women, the right two figures results for men. The top panels show results for FEV1 and the bottom panel results for FVC. On the x-axis, we have different reference equations being evaluated. Please ignore the first three results. These are interim algorithms in our stepwise model development. We should start by looking at M4, which is our final model. The y-axis gives the mean difference between directly observed and algorithmically predicted for the respective prediction equations. The units are z-scores, that is standard deviations of population distribution. A difference of one thus indicates that the prediction equation is inaccurate by an entire standard deviation. In this external data set, we see that the GLI and NHANES models again are highly inaccurate for all in both men and women and for both the major lung parameters measured. In contrast, green. Our model developed in South Asia Biobank on average predicted lung function almost exactly. Our new reference equation is thus robust and generalizable to South Asians in a wide range of settings. We, we believe this represents a valuable step forward for respiratory care and the manuscript describing these findings is currently under review. So that covers our epidemiological framework within our global health research network. It's a program of work designed to help us understand why the tap is turned on and thus how we might go about turning it off. Our other three programs of work are translational and aim to improve prevention and control of cardiometabolic disease in South Asians, including through adaptation, strengthening and scale up of established approaches. I think we're up to about 30 minutes already, so I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that I'll keep each of these to a high level summary.
Our first translation approach uses digital strategies for delivering behaviour change for health promotion and prevention of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The motivation needs little justification. Cardiometabolic disease is preventable through behaviour change, but traditional measures are resource intensive and not scalable. Although digital strategies are likely to be less effective than face-to-face -face approaches, they offer the tremendous opportunity of low cost, high reach and rapid scalability. Our network has tremendous expertise in diabetes prevention using both traditional and digital media. In particular, I draw attention to the involvement of Jonathan Vilabji, who is director of the UK's National Diabetes Prevention Programme, and also to Dr. R.M. Angina and the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, who have led a number of sentinel studies on diabetes prevention in South Asia. Our programme is in two phases. We are initially carrying out development of behaviour change platforms based upon chatbot and gamification approaches. These have been implemented in pilot studies, including comparison to leading commercial products. The pilot studies will complete in the next four weeks. Based on the results of these initial data, we will identify the most promising application and carry out iterative design to optimize performance. As phase two, our global health research network will carry out a randomized evaluation of the digital intervention to assess impact on cardiometabolic risk, including weight, blood pressure, and HbA1c. The sample size is large, enabling us to identify modest effects and to understand the impact in key population subgroups. Our second translational theme is again digital but asks the question, how can digital platforms be optimized to enable and strengthen care coordination and delivery of high quality care by primary healthcare teams? The ambition is to inform development of digital tools that support and enable task shifting for prevention and control of chronic disease by frontline health workers. A key focus is on strengthening coordination of care between the frontline workers in the community and the domain experts, the leaders in the NCD hubs. We seek to understand how the platforms can support the needs of users and enable rather than hinder their work. A second key focus is on digital guidelines and understanding how care coordination platforms can incorporate algorithm engines and inform evidence-based decision-making. Critically, the approaches developed must be generalizable to diverse healthcare environments and must take advantage of interoperability with frameworks such as FHIR and SNOMED. Our approach has gone through multiple rounds of stakeholder engagement and user-centric design, we now have a version one of our care coordination platform that has been implemented into a demonstration project in two primary healthcare clusters in Bangladesh, involving several thousand people. This pilot study will complete in January. Informed by the results, we will redesign, redevelop the platform and demonstrate in additional settings, working as ever in close partnership with local healthcare teams to ensure that the platform is fit for purpose and strengthens existing infrastructure. We also collaborate with the WHO digital health teams to ensure that we are aligned to emerging global standards and digital guidelines and data interoperability. Our third and final implementation project addresses policy and environmental intervention for health promotion. The project is being jointly run between, by the Health Promotion Bureau of Sri Lanka, the Universities of Kelaniya and Colombo, and Imperial College London. 
the importance of policy and environment for prevention of cardiometabolic disease was first established by the North Karelia Project, which started almost 50 years ago in 1972. Key components include improving health literacy, providing a favorable environment for health, and nudging people's behaviors. The purpose of our implementation project is to, is to test whether such interventions can be used to prevent cardiometabolic disease in the South Asian context as well. The proposed intervention has been developed jointly and iteratively over the last two years and comprises both community-based and school-based interventions. The intervention includes advocacy, education through health promotion officers, providing information about local health metrics, social marketing for nudging, and a strong healthy meal policy. The project will begin in 2022 and will involve approximately 100 sites across Sri Lanka. We will enroll uh, around 20,000 people, comprising 13,500 adults and 6,500 children. The intervention will last six months in the first instance, and participants will be assessed at baseline six and 12 months. The primary outcome will be cardiometabolic risk factors, including weight, blood pressure, healthy diet indicators, alcohol intake, and cigarette smoking. The results will provide a powerful evidence base on which to inform national policy in Sri Lanka, with results that will be transferable to other South Asian settings. In addition to delivering innovative research that addresses the needs of South Asia, our Global Health Research Network also aims to build and strengthen capacity for NCD research in the region. We have already helped crystallize the formation of three centers of excellence within the region, based in Bangladesh, Kelaniya, and Colombo. The ambition is for these centers of excellence to provide a focal point for leadership and coordination, to develop local clinical research networks, and to contribute to development of a strong international Asian research network. The centers will underpin training and growth of human capacity, development of technical expertise, interdisciplinary research and collaboration, and dissemination activities such as recommendations for local policy and action. We have a strong commitment to training the next generation of researchers. Over the last four years, we have contributed to the training of more than, of more than a thousand individuals across a range of skills. This will continue during the next phase of our work. We have dedicated funding for South Asian researchers to complete master's courses PhD studentships and exchange programs. We will also be running multiple short courses. Many of the short courses are international to further promote uh, cross-border collaboration, insights into best practice and cross-fertilization of ideas. So that brings me to my conclusion slide. My key take home points are are to say that we have brought together what I think is a wonderful global health research network focused upon addressing non-communicable disease in South Asian communities. The network has created South Asia Biobank as a unique resource for population health research with pathways in place to generate rich molecular and clinical phenotypes for epidemiological investigations. We have demonstrated commitment to collaboration and data access, including data democratization. Our research network has a strong translational component. We have an emphasis on digital health strategies, as well as policy and environment. We are also committed to building capacity in non-communicable disease research across South Asia. We work closely with local communities, researchers, healthcare providers and policymakers to ensure that our work addresses national research priorities. I'm extremely grateful to the very many researchers who are part of our network and who have made this research possible, 
sometimes during very challenging circumstances. I'm also very grateful for the friendship, support and collaboration with Anu and Prasad, who lead the programme for Sri Lanka. Our network is committed to collaboration. And if anyone would like to know more about our research or to get involved, please do contact Anu and Prasad, who will be pleased to advise. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this presentation has been insightful and I look forward to meeting in person at some point in the future. Very interesting talk on a very impressive project. Uh, you, you will take up some questions. There are there is one right now. Uh, I'll read the question out. How would GHRU support capacity building in South Asia for addressing behavioral change? Um, okay, so I touched on that. We are committed to building capacity for non-communicable disease research in the region. Um, that will be multidisciplinary capacity building. Uh, we anticipate building expertise in molecular epidemiology, in behavioral epidemiology, in policy and environmental research, uh, and in digital health research and implementation science. Now, clearly, we can't be all things to all people. So we need to have a well-measured, structured approach to make sure that we build capacity, support capacity building sensibly. To do that, the network has a training committee uh, with a, a, a 10 or so members on, uh, and it's led by South Asia colleagues. Um, it's the job of the training committee to prioritize and develop a strategy for which kind of posts, which kind of courses we develop, which kind of posts we recruit into uh, for uh, PhD programs and for postdoctoral programs, and, and to encourage centers to make sensible choices that they want to develop you know, expertise in, 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 in platforms A and B, while a different centre might develop expertise in, 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 in approaches C and D. Uh, so it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a community-led uh, activity uh, uh, which, which, will, which aims to address a, a, the, the multidisciplinary nature of, 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 of this kind of epidemiological research. Yeah, thanks, John. There is another question. How would the South Asia Power Bank address administration and ethical issues related to genetic studies, for example, material transfer? Uh, so it's it's material transfer agreements are, are determined by the institutions and countries with which we partner. If there are material transfer objections, then the transfer doesn't happen. Um, we we it's 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 i mean it's it's it's, it's an interesting problem and and if you want to get an assay done you've got to send it to a place to get the assay done and and that's inevitably inevitably often going to involve a material transfer um the key thing to appreciate is that the this isn't a letterbox approach with you know, samples being sent off to third, third party countries and nothing coming back. The sample goes off to a laboratory, the assay gets done and the results get returned to South Asia. So this is, we hope, a very equitable and justice-based approach. Okay. Uh, John, can I ask a mm. question now? If you look at cardiovascular mortality, mm. let's say Europe and North America, it has been decreasing since about the late 60s or 70s. Mm. What do you think was the reason for that? And cannot those reasons be translated to South Asia? Mm. Very good. So it's, 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 a, 
It's obviously a, a mixture of things. The primary driver has been the progressive reduction in tobacco consumption, cigarette smoking in, in Europe and the US over the last 30 to 40 years. Now, I remember as a child, you know, you, you, you traveled around town and people used to smoke on airplanes and, and in buses and in trains. And that's just a thing of the past now. Smoking has become a rarity. And smoking is, of course, a, you know, one of the primary drivers for cardiovascular disease. And that alone probably accounts for the greatest fraction of the reduction in cardiovascular risk. And that is, of course, eminently translatable through good education, public health policy and taxation policy. There are also components uh, that of, of the improvement that have arisen through um, improved primary prevention measures such as statin and blood pressure treatment uh, and through improved, to some extent, improved diets. Um, uh, and, and an increasing uptake uh, of, of, of screening manoeuvres so that people are detected with diabetes and cardiovascular risk at an earlier stage in their health trajectories. So those might represent you know, uh, health related interventions uh, that have helped contribute to, to health promotion. Are those transferable too? Yes, yes, of course they are. Uh, the challenge is, of course, they, they do require some resources. On the upside, though, the, the, resort, the, 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 the therapies being proposed, statins and blood pressure lowering treatments, are within our grasp in terms of cost. So if we can create primary healthcare systems, frontline worker systems, that enable uh, healthcare teams to do high quality screening, risk assessment, and educate and to identify high-risk people, educate and provide uh, appropriate interventions, then there's every prospect, I think, that those can be brought to, to bear in, in the Asian context. And that really underpins you know, a lot of our translational program of work, particularly the care coordination piece. Okay, and were there any other behavioral interventions that happened under them for the smoking and <coughs> the main one was the main one was smoking um yeah, most other behavioral measures such as trying to pe get people to lose weight or or improve the quality of their diet have been less successful and um, they're they're a major focus for attention now uh, but i don't i think people in the uk would say we don't understand yet how best to move people away from uh, unhealthy diets towards better diets, uh, except through taxation policies. Okay, thanks, John. Do we have any more questions? Right. So in the absence of any more questions, then uh, we can close this uh, plenary session. Thank you very much, John. We really appreciate Thank your... Thank you, Rosh. I hope it's worthwhile. Bending time. Bye. Yes, very much. Very interesting and very impressive. Okay, so with that, I close this plenary session and the next symposium will start at nine o'clock.